So I'm going to talk about most of the work that I'm talking about is published, and I assume most people haven't read it because nobody has time. But in the last 15 minutes, I'm going to show you some novel uh, aspects of, of trying to identify uh, novel targets for the microprocessors that are different than microRNAs. So this is a kind of boring slide. You, it's for undergrads, basically, just to show you that we have been interested traditionally interested in alternative spacing regulation. This stem back from, from, from my time in Cosmic Howe, Adrian Craner. Well, we have been looking at transacting factors that regulate alternative splicing, and there are up to 95% of the of the old uh, the pre-mRNAs are alternative splice. And the most common pattern of alternative splicing is exon inclusion and skipping. And we have this red exon that can be included, for, perhaps in, during certain developmental situations, certain tissues, and can be skipped in another. And then all these other types of alternative splicing. So what we, my lab and Ukraine and others have worked for the most part is in the exon inclusion skipping and the alternative five prime of three, three prime splice sites. Uh, so we have been working for a number of years in these two families of proteins that have antagonistic roles in alternative splicing regulation. One is these SR proteins and the other HMPAB type of proteins. From this cartoon, you can see that uh, structurally they look very similar. They have this module here, either one or two at the end terminus known as RNA recognition motifs. Sometimes in the literature you find them as R RBN for RNA binding, RBDs for RBN binding domains. And these are present not only in splicing factor, but in many proteins by to RNA. And then uh, they have the, the SR protein have a C-terminal domain, very rich in dipeptides, arginine and serine, and paradoxically, this is called the RS domain, but the name of the protein coined by Mark Roth many years ago is SR proteins. So there are approximately 10 of these proteins cloning in, in humans, and there are other sort of subfamily non SR related proteins. And these proteins have several interest, interesting uh, features. They are highly conserved throughout evolution, up to POMBI, but absent in yeast. And then uh, subs, there are nuclear state states that localize in mammalian and nuclei to a particular structure known as the nuclear speckles. And a subset of them here identified in blue are shuttling continuously from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And at that point, we suggested with Adrian Krenna this could be indi indicative of a role of them in the cytoplasm. To make things more complicated, uh, this year, last, at the end of last year, the whole nomenclature of this protein has been changed, and now is, is, this protein is known as SRSF. So if you see in the literature, for instance, SF2, ASF, is known as SRSF1, and so on and so forth. So the antagonistic proteins in alternative spacing regulation, the HNMP, AB type of proteins, are very similar indeed in their uh, modular structure. They are also conserved or though less conserved than SR proteins. But the interesting thing, they don't have an RS domain, and they have a glycine-rich domain at the C-terminus, and this sequence M9 is important for the import and export of the protein. So this illustrates uh, work from many different labs. I'm going to concentrate on, on, on this part of the slide. So how does, uh, and pre people probably uh, familiar with the work on Barali and Burati, and others are familiar with this. So how is an alternative exon regulated? Usually they have suboptimal splice sites. In the case, imagine here you have a suboptimal 3 prime splice site. So the way that this exon is converted from, from being skipping to being, uh, for instance, included, is because there is uh, an arrangement of these acting sequences. If there are positive, we call them enhancers. This is an exonic splicing enhancer. If there are negative, we call them silencers. And it, to complicate things, it could be exonic, but could also be intronic. So uh, an arrangement of cis acting sequence interacting with transacting factors, some with positive action, is a protein bind to enhance for the most part and promote the inclusion and otherwise skip exon. By contrast, HMP uh, proteins antagonize the effect of SR proteins. And, and so this we propose at the time that this could be a way to regulate by, by, by changing the levels of general splicing factors, not, not tissue specific, but general splicing factors. This could be a way of regulating alternative splicing in a tissue specific manner of the development. And this is a very old uh, slide. I was a collaborator in this paper from Akemi Hanamur and Adrian Slav was published in RNA. Uh, what Akemi did mostly here is shown in rat tissues the distribution of SF2, SF or SRSF1, and HMPA1 and by, by, by Western blots. And so we can see here the important thing is the ratio, that although both proteins are ubiquitous, the ratio of these proteins changes drastically over tissue. And that's one way, at least, of explaining uh, how, how alternative splicing could be regulated. Are there any tissue-specific factors? There are. So there are very few. One of these is the, the fact the proteins called NOVA, identified, for instance, by the, by the Darnell lab, and some muscle uh, proteins. But these are uh, the reallocation. Whether that reflects that they are difficult to be identified, or there are less of them, is not clear. So, as I mentioned before, uh, 
we show that the subset of these subproteins shuttling continues from the nucleus to cytoplasm. And in my lab, in Edinburgh, Jeremy Sanford, a former postdoc of my lab, who's now in, U in UC Santa Cruz, showing these two papers that indeed is a, is a protein, shutting is a protein, SF2, ESF, can activate translation using a report assistance. Here we use a, a binding site taken up actually from the Varale lab, from the fibronectin EDA enhancer, and we put this binding site. It, so first, first I'm going to describe this part. So we, we could position the shutting of proteins at the right place to activate translation. When we fractionate HeLa cell cytoplasmic extracts, and then we run uh, Western blocks, you could see that shutting of proteins are in monosomes and lighter polysomes, and these are just control ribosomal protein and polybinding protein. So this position these proteins in the right place. But more important, we develop vectors, reporters, both for transfection type experiments or in vitro experiments, in which we put binding sites taken from the fibronectin EDA, and we can see when we have a binding site for, 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 for SF2SF, we have increased translation. So that told us that SF proteins are in the right place and can activate translation, at least in this reporter type of uh, experiments. So uh, another former postdoc in my lab, Gracia Mislev, he just opened his lab in, at the University of Edinburgh, show uh, in subsequent studies the mechanism of this, this happens. So Gracian was able to show that what SF2 ESF, this RSF1, binding to its particular target, recruits components of them to signaling pathway, and that leads to, to phosphorylation of a natural inhibitor of translation, the 4 EVP proteins that when get phosphorylated get released from the 4 E cap cytoplasmic cap binding protein and allow trans uh, translation to occur. So we're doing actively now, we have a, a lot of data I'm not going to show today. It's about we, we are now using polysomal fractionation in cells with different levels of SF2 and to, to show by polysomal shift mRNAs that move to the polysomes upon SF2 over expression. So we believe that we have identified a, a, a series of targets that are real translational targets of, uh, of SF2 and SF. So an important feature of these studies is to try to, to identify RNA targets for this protein, for HNMP protein, for SF protein. For that, what we do is we have resorted to, to a protocol developed by Bob Darnell and colleagues in Rockefeller University. I guess probably some of you use it here, which is known as a, a cross-linking immunoprecipitation protocol known as CLIP. There are several advantages of this protocol. This is a UV-dependent uh, protocol, so by UV radiation of cells in culture, for instance, HeLa cells or 293s, where you create a covalent cross-link between your protein of interest and the RNA. And then this allows many different things. First, allows more stringent washes so you can get rid of contaminants. This protocol involves several RNA titration, so in the end you end up with a fragment of RNA bound by the protein that is protected from RNAs by the protein itself. So this is the old protein developed by Yerne Ule when he was a, a PhD student in, Bob, in Bob's lab, uh, and it was kind of a complicated protein in, implied to clone these, uh, these fragments, but it was successful in resorting identification of a few hundred targets per protein. Now, obviously, in the last few years, we have adapted to a new protocol which combines this the UV cross-linking precipitation with deep sequencing. But for the purpose of what I'm going to show you next, we use the old-fashioned protocol, and Jeremy Sample in my lab identified a series of approximately 300 targets for SF2 ESF, which fall into every category as expected. But the interesting thing from this is when we do bioinformatics and we look at the consensus sequence from what we get, the, the preferred binding site for SF2 ESF, we find a, a binding site that is almost identical to the one that Barale found in the fibronectin EDA enhancer, which is one of the most studied enhancers in, in, in splicing. And when Sanford started his own lab in California, he adapted this protocol to his clip and published an interesting uh, paper where now instead of 300, they have several thousand <coughs> targets for SF2SF, so you can see the targets there. So, all this introduction is just to tell you what we were doing before and what happened when we were doing the, the CLIP old-fashioned protocol to, to the antagonist of SF, for FSF2-ESF, HMPA1. So we did a similar protocol, CLIP protocol. We identified several hundred mRNA um, targets that we never published because we got distracted by something else. And what distracted us was the identification of a single microRNA at that stage, which is, happens to be an interesting microRNA because it's, it's microRNA 18A, which is part of this cluster 1792 that was made 
famous by Greg Hannan and colleagues in Cosmic Harbor because they show that this uh, first is uh, this polysystem, which is intronic, is amplifying human cell lymphomas. And Greg and colleagues show that enforced expression of this cluster can ac accelerate tumor development in B cells. So, what we did find with our CLIP experiment was A1 was binding to the 18A but not to any other member of the cluster. So we did, we did many experiments to confirm independently of UV, independently of the CLIP protocol by classical RNA chromatography that A1 indeed was binding to 18A but not to any other member of, of, the, of this family of, the, of microarrays in this cluster. And then uh, this is just to, to remind me to tell you how the microbiogenesis pathway work. So uh, the DNA, so that the gene, the microarray genes is transcribed in our case uh, to produce a prime microRNA, which in our case would be the six um, microRNAs in the intronic cluster. And then this is basically cropped by a nuclear processing event by a, a RNAs3 type enzyme drosha with a, in, col in collaboration with the partner known as DCRA. This is a microprocessor. So the microprocessor takes the prime microRNA to a pre microRNA, approximately 65 nucleotides which is exported by exporting phi to the cytoplasm and once in the cytoplasm is cleaved again by a second enzyme known as Dicer and produces approximately 21, 22 nucleotide uh, RNA. One strand of this is incorporated into a risk complex and exerts its function as a microRNA. So if you go back here, the event of cropping uh, would be that what the microprocessor would do is separate each one of these individual microRNAs, which will be pre-microRNAs, will be exported and then, and then uh, become microRNAs, functional microRNAs. So what we went on to show, that was work from, from former postdoc Sonia Gill, Sonia went on to show that A1 binds to 18A, not to other members of the cluster, and also binds that prior to Drosha processing. So what interesting to see whether A1 was involved in the splicing of this intron, was really involved in the processing of this. So to get independent of splicing, what I suggested her to do was just to do in vitro processing of a, a fragment of RNA which would comprise either the whole cluster or part of this cluster. So she did a fantastic experiment very quickly. So she, here she, she did use two clusters, and this was published almost four years ago. So she, published, she used an experimental cluster which has our binding side 18A, surrounded by the two natural neighbors, 17 and 19A. And also, as a control, she used this basically irrelevant cluster for, for the purpose of the experiment. So we, we followed Nardi Kim's protocols. We did in vitro processing, which is not very different from, from in vitro splicing protocols. And here what you can see is after 90 minutes of incubation in the extract, you see a nice production of the pre microRNA. So this, this is the production of 18A. But interesting, when we do depletion of A1 by SRNA-mediated depletion, which is very efficient, there is complete abrogation of the production. So that tells you that A1, independent of splicing, is absolutely required for the processing of this. However, if we deplete A1, there is no effect on the production of microRNA-27. So this and other experiments told us, OK, A1 is directly involved in the processing of this pre-microRNA. Pre so why? So we know it's binding. We know that it's involved in the processing. So how does it work? Sonia did a nice experiment I'm not going to show you. Is then she moved this 18 into a different context. She, she replaced 27 by 18. And what she found there is now that one was not required. So that was a bit strange. And suggested to us there were probably some local structures here involved, RNA structures, uh, issues that were determined that they one was required. So how we can solve that? So at that time, Gracia Mislewski, another former postdoc in my lab, joined. And so together with Sonia, they did a bunch of experiments. So Gracia had a lot of expertise in this type of technique. So we wanted to precisely map whether a one was binding to this cluster of pre-microRNAs. So we do an experiment that is easier to do than to interpret, which is this footprint analysis of pre-microRNA-18, uh, in which we basically we do in vitro transcribe the pre-microRNA, and we incubated uh, that with or without addition of or recombinant protein, HMP1, and then we subject the complex to cleavage by different agents. In this particular experiment, I'm showing the cleavage by the lead ions, which recognize single-stranded single RNA with some sequence preference. So you can see here a footprint with a typical footprint analysis. But if you focus here, for instance, in this red box, this corrects, corrects, and we can map this where the position of the basis is, the nucleotide is. So here, this red box corresponds to this terminal loop. As you can see here, that there is a protection in, in when we add recombinant HMP1. So the, what this tells you that it was binding here 
and precluding the nucleus to cut. This is similar in concept to, to the old-fashioned transcriptional footprints that people were doing for promoters. But interestingly, we also observe not only protection, but increased cleavage in certain regions. And this corresponds to this region. You see, you see this cleavage only where you have A1. And from this and many other experiments, we interpreted this as A1 binding to a terminal loop and also binding to here, to the base of the stem, and inducing a bulge here that makes this more processable by drosia. So this is an, uh, we were very convinced of this by many different experiments. I'm not going to show you that in the paper. But the ultimate test for this was we were lucky enough that it's a similar microRNA, very similar, almost identical microRNA called microRNA 18B, which is an application in different clusters and different chromosomes in chromosome X. And it has been shown that 18B does not, we were, we were able to show that 18B does not require uh, HMP1. So how does this work? So we got and Sonia look at the structure, first by computer prediction and second by, by nucleus mapping. They found that 18A, so this is dying, I think, and oh, no, it's okay. So 18A has a, a, a closed stem, whereas 18B, which does not require A1, has this bulge here, which is what A1 does when it binds here and induces this. So the obvious prediction to this, okay, can we, so the, the experiment that we designed and miraculously happened is basically we open by mutagenesis 18A and we say, okay, if we, if we have now an open 18A, now we will not require HMP1. And usually that, those predictions are easy to make them to fulfill, but in this case it was true. So we could uh, show here, and this is again a repetition of the first experiment I showed you before. In the, this is in vitro production of the control uh, and, and the control conditions of extract. If you deplete HMP1, now the, the process is abrogated. But here, when we have a micronet but mutagen is already open, now we don't require HMP1. So this really clearly tells us, in our view, that this is the case. So what we're doing now, in collaboration with Michael Sattler at uh, the University of Munich, so we're doing NMR and crystal structures of this complex of HMP1 with uh, um, Micron 18A, because we, there are many things we want to know. We want to confirm there are two binding sites. We want to know what is contact between these. We want to know the functional domains of the protein that is involved in this process. OK. So this is a summary for the, this first part. that was published in these two papers. And this I should note this, that this is a joint first author between Grazian and Sonia. And so basically what we found here completely serendipitously by, by looking at targets of HMP1 that a protein involved in splicing is indeed also affecting microRNA biogenesis at the nucleus step by binding to a terminal loop and restructuring the RNA and making it more <coughs> processable. Okay? So another, I think, interesting consequence from these studies was that we found that the main binding site was a terminal loop. And so, so far, Nari Kim has shown uh, that this was not the case for, for many microRNAs. For instance, in this case, you can see this is a plot conservation across 17 species. And this is what was known before, what people have looked at. A perfect conservation in green corresponds to the sequence of the, of the microRNA, but there's a dip in the conservation of the terminal loop. And actually, Nari Kim was able to show during in vitro with microRNA 16 that if you even open up by digestion the terminal loop, you still can process the microRNA. So, what we observe in this case, with the help of Colin Semple, the bioinformatician of the unit, is that in the case of our microRNA that binds A1, the conservation is outstanding. So it's, uh, it's perfect across 17 species. And when we look, and that was a few years ago, and there was, I think there was uh, close to 600 microRNAs in the database that are more now, we found that 74% of these microRNAs have conserved terminal loops. So these conserved terminal loops, we found that as diagnostic for, for landing paths for transacting factors that could regulate microRNAs either positively or negatively. And also this is important, it could be at, at both levels. Could be at the level of drosh in the nucleus, but also could be at the level of dyes in the cytoplasm, because once exported, the terminal loop is still there before the dyes are processing. Okay, so this event of terminal loop, uh, Gracia and Sonia designed this, this, uh, this uh, I thought, an elegant strategy. Okay, if this is true, we should be able to block the process of this microRNA by, by, a, by a loop tomir, by, by an oligo that targets the loop, because that would compete the proteins and bind the RNA. So when we put a loop tomir, a specific, this is a, a microRNA with no concerted terminal loop, and this is one with a concerted terminal loop. When we put the, the specific uh, loop tomir against six, the loop of 16.1, 
there's no effect in beta processing or with the, or with the control microRNA. But it, by contrast, when we target the, the, the loop of a conserved one, we see we can completely abolish the presence. So this is another way of, of showing that basically the recognition of the terminal loop by, by one is important for the subsequent processing. Uh, so what Gracian decided to do next is to focus on this list of microRNAs, and he looked at many of them. And what sounds here very interesting, this family has, is very important for cancer, the let seven family of microRNAs. So we decided to do, uh, and we are focusing also on this uh, MIR-30C, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So we found some prot interesting protein binding to 30C. I'm going to scan now for LED7 just because it's a, again A1, what is binding there. So what we did is an RNA chromatography assay in which we incubate the, the, the fragment of the terminal loop with extracts, and we find two HNMP protein binding there, HNMP1 and L. When we do in vitro processing, getting rid of this protein by SNR depletion, we have said that L has no effect, so we continue our studies with HMP1. So again, the same protein, and again a microRNA. So what was the biological consequence of having A1? First, what is known about LED7? LED7 is an important family of microRNAs. It has been shown that in ES undifferentiated cells, LED7 is repressed at the post-transcription level. Why do you need LED7 to be repressed? Because LED7 targets promoting growth, growth promoting genes like RAS and others and HMG proteins. So the way this repressed in undifferentiated cells is by the binding of these proteins, LIN28A and LIN20B, 20, uh, 20 that bind to a terminal loop and block the processing. And, and there are discrepancies between different labs and say there's a level of drosh and say the level of dicer. So in undifferentiated cells, you don't have LED7 being produced because you are blocked that by LIN28. Uh, actually, LIN28 is uh, it's a cancer-promoting gene, and there are mutations in patients that you have production of, of LIN28. So either if you produce LIN28 or you mutate LED7, you, you can develop cancer. So in this particular case, when the cells go through differentiation, the, the expression of LIN28 is turned off. So then LED7 should be expressed. However, the level of mature LED7 different between different uh, human, differentiated human cells, so suggests that it's unidentified post-transcriptional repress, so that is not LIN28. So we, we reason this could be again A1, although A1 is a positive factor for 18A. So what Gracian did here is he looked at where there is a complex between, uh, the, by, by M's analysis, between recombinant HMP1 and the, 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 this terminal loop. And you can see here, just in the family of seven, just the, this is the winner sequence defined by Gideon Dreyfus for HMP1 many years ago. So you can see here there is binding, predictive binding site for HMP1, and you form a complex with a recombinant protein and, and the LED7 terminal loop, not with the mutant one. So what I'm going to show you in the next three slides is just correlation, but I think it makes a story. And the, 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 the first one is basically that if you take the levels of LED7, the mature microRNA, negatively correlate with the levels of A1. So what Gracian managed to establish here is uh, three cell lines, 293Ts, HILAS, and anastrocytoma cell line. And these three cell lines have very different levels of HMP1 as measured by Western blood. 293 has high levels of HMP1, HILAS relatively abundant, but it's, it's low levels in astrocytoma. I put here KSRP because this is another <coughs> HMP protein will become important later. And this is just a loading control. So you, you can see here is basically an interesting correlation. In cells that have very high levels of HMP1, 293Ts, you see there is almost no production of mature LED7. So this suggests again that A1 could be the repressor of differentiated cells of LED7 production. Uh, this intermediate situation, the cells with a lower level of A1, you have the higher levels of LED7. Interesting, you can see here, although it's very faint, that in, HILA, in cells where you have more A1, you have more production of the, of the, of the microRNA that A1 is facilitating with 18 a so this is correlative, and we have done some other experiments to suggest that A1 could indeed be the, the repressor of this microRNA. Uh, but, the, but the real experiment is just to do the in vitro process. And here you, you observe the, 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 the opposite effect of the cell with 18A. We're doing again in vitro processing, and you can see here that uh, basically when we, this is the control levels. When we deplete A1, which is the repressor, we see now an increased level of, of production of, of the, uh, the pre-LED7A1. 
And here, again, the opposite, the converse effect, uh, experiment, instead of depleting, we take a helix and we add a recombinant one, and one is, is, is blocking the production of this. So, uh, so far, so good. So we have binding of HMP1 to one microRNA 18A, terminal loop, we know the mechanisms, re re rearrangement of RNA structure, and we see an effect. Here we see also biological effect, but we don't understand the mechanism. What we're doing, uh, uh, we decided to do here was to do the same experiments that we did with uh, HNMP, with uh, microRNA-18A, which is do footprint analysis. Again, recombinant A1, uh, naked array transcribed in vitro, and different cleavage agents. Here we use, again, lead ions. I use T1 that cuts following G residues. From this and many other experiments, we came up with this interpretation of the results, which is that HNMP1 is binding to a terminal loop and open this up. So here we don't see this induction of the bulge that we have seen, but that's logical because it's a different sequence. But so why the binding of HMP1 could be blocking the production of this uh, uh, permacarnate, which is actually quite, farther, quite far away from the, from, the, from the site of cleavage. So some of these experiments came up from, from this paper that was published at the moment that we were preparing our paper uh, by uh, Rosenfeld uh, with collaboration with Filipovich. So what this guy showed, without showing mechanism, but I think somehow interest anyways, is that this positive, this HNMP protein, KSRP, has a positive role in the production of mature led 7 a So although we're not happy with this, help us to, to, to focus our experiments. And what we did then is, okay, now if we know that A1 binds to a terminal loop and remodels the terminal loop, and we know from Rosenfeld's data that, that this happens by binding to, to the terminal loop, why don't we do the footprint for, for KSRP? And we did that. And if, you, if I superimpose both images, are absolutely identical. So we got the KSRP from Doc Black in UCLA, the recombinant protein. We did the same experiment that we did with A1. And we observed oh, actually almost an identical footprint, which is KSRP is binding there and um, opening up the structure. So we did some uh, gel shift competitive analysis, and we interpret our result as saying that the there's a mutual exclusive binding of a positive factor KSRP or a negative factor HMP1. So if you have high abundance of HMP1, you, you compete out KSRP and you block the process. So here is no bar structure in any RNA. What it's doing is here is by competing out a KSRP. Uh, now the question is why KSRP is, is positive factor? That we don't know. We, we, we haven't focused on that. So this is a summary uh, for this part. And uh, which shows both aspects of, of HMP1. HMP1 as a activator of microRNA biogenesis by binding to a terminal loop and restructuring the RNA, publishing these two papers. And then the more recent story published last year by Grazian is basically HMP1 binding to a terminal loop and then causing the opposite effect, which is uh, blocking or acting as a negative factor, but by a completely different mechanism, which in this case is, is competing out the positive factor. So, uh, the important thing, I think, is that this is not restricted to HMP1 or KSRP, but it's a really a, a, a sort of a dominant uh, aspect in the field. And this is summarized here in this uh, review by the Xiomis, mm -hmm. we were in Japan, uh, in which they show different uh, post transcription regulators of microRNA biogenesis. And you can see here the feature work here, HMP1, positive for HNA or negative for let's say, but you see a lot of different proteins. For instance, you see even P53 that has a, a, a promoting effect or these uh, nucleases, uh, sorry, helicases, P68, P72, etc. So it, it's been a common feature that many different proteins can bind to the micro, to the micro, to prime microRNAs or pre microRNAs and regulate the drosha or the dye. So this is a very highly regulated process. Okay. So what I'm going to focus in the last 15 minutes or so is in the new studies, this is not published, of uh, cellular targets for, for the microprocessor. So this is a microprocessor, it's the first part. I show the nuclear event that, pro that goes from a prime microRNA to a pre microRNA of approximately 65 nucleotides. Here I have the catalytic activity of that Catalyzed that is a human drosis and RNAs, has an RNA domain, although it's not very clear what the function of this is, and has two RNAs, three uh, domains, and double standard RNA binding domain. So this is very elegant. It's, here's a review by Dudna, 
by his, uh, this work is a cell paper from, from Nari Kim. And what he showed here is basically that the recognition of the structure RNA is not first done by Drosha, but it's, uh, accomplished by this uh, RNA binding protein, uh, has double standard RNA binding domains known as DGCR8. So DGCR8 is the first one to, co to contact these structure RNAs and recruits Drosha. And there is a counting mechanism in which this complex cleaves here at 11 base pairs from the junction of single-stranded, double-stranded RNA. Okay? So what we decided to do a few years ago was we asked the question whether, because this is a structure RNA, we asked the question whether the microprocessor, DCR8 and uh, Androsha, could indeed act to cleave structure RNAs other than microRNAs. So for this, we thought that a good idea, a good strategy would be, since the, the, the binding factor is DCR8, is to conduct a heat clip, a high throughput sequencing clip, to identify cellular targets for DCR8. And that's what we did. Uh, I, I should mention that the microprocess that was identified again by Hannon and, and, and three or four, uh, this is a paper actually for Chihatar. Uh, this is a flag tag experiment in which they, they immunoprecipitate Drosha. And you can see here, of course, many, this array comes here, but there are many other proteins binding there. So we, and, and a common factor of this is two nuclear species, TAP72. So this could act as an entry point for many other regulatory factors. Okay? So, and you can see here, actually, even TDP43 that was published by, by Burati and Barale, that's also a regulatory factor for, for primary coronaries. So we did a hits clip. Uh, and this is work from a current postdoc in my lab, Sarah Macias, uh, for this CRA. So this, again, a cross-linking immunoprecipitation uh, protocol coupled to high-throughput sequencing. And with this Illumina Solexa ultra-deep sequencing. And we got a large number of, of clip tags. And, and what we have found here is, uh, first, things that we were looking to find that are reassuring. First, we found almost all microRNAs expressing the cells that we did the, the experiment, which is reassuring. So uh, the microprocessor processes microRNAs, so that's good news. So the second thing what we found, actually we not scoop, but basically we came with this idea that this could be regulating mRNAs. And actually Nardi Kim again published a paper in Cell, I think a year or two ago, in which he showed that the microprocessor binds to the pre-mRNA of the GCRA itself. So there is, is a, loop cell, a loop regulation here. So that's fine. But what we did find is a, a lot of putative novel microprocessor substrates. We found a, a lot of mRNAs, which is interesting, <coughs> including the GCR and mRNA. But we find both, also the 5 MTS and the promoters. We found uh, small nuclear RNAs. And here is an important uh, aspect I'm going to allude a, a bit later. And finally, we also found some retrotransposon RNA. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the validation of, of, of those and uh, what we think the, the status of the field is with that. Uh, so let me put this animation out of the question so I relax a bit. So here we have uh, what is important here. We can uh, ignore the details, but we can see here that, we, of course, we have clip tags, and that's common in any heat through, uh, high throughput clip uh, exercise, but we find a lot of repeat RNAs, a lot of protein coding, etc. And then even between uh, these non-coding RNAs, as I mentioned, we found microRNAs as expected, we found small nuclear RNAs, all sorts of RNAs. And, and then even between mRNA, we have <coughs> the coding exon, et cetera. So this is uh, more or less what we would find if you do any sort of clip uh, exercise. The important thing then is the validation of this, of this exercise. So here I'm going to show you only a few of them. For example, here's a, a particular example of this an mRNA decapping enzyme, the mRNA for mRNA decapping enzyme. And here with the tool that we use is we, uh, we alternate between mouse cells where we have a knockout for the for DCR8. It's a commercially available uh, knockout cell line, DCR8 knockout. Or we, we, we move back to, to, to human cells and then we have to deplete either Drosha or DCR8 by SRA, which is not uh, always very efficient. So here you can see when we do the experiments in mice, uh, uh, and we have clip tags here at, at, at the, uh, in, in the in the three PMTR. You can see here that when you don't have the CR8, you have an elevated uh, level of of uh, DCP1 at, at the at the RNA, mRNA level. You can see here and here you see in in, in in human cells when you deplete the Drosha. So here is DCR8 knockout in mouse cells. Here is Drosha 
uh, depletion in human cells. So in both cases, you can see the microprocessor is uh, indeed binding and, and, and degrading this RNA. And you can see even this even by Western blood. So you can see here the, the increase in protein when in the knockout of, of uh, this RNA. And this, this, the same thing happened for, for many of these uh, mRNAs. Uh, we have clip tags basically in, in many different places. Uh, an interesting aspect of this is we, we thought it could be possible, and we still think it's possible, that, that the microprocessor could, could act to regulate alternative splicing. Because sometimes you're going to have clip tags in alternative exons. Here's, here's a transcription factor, TCF3. And you can see here there is a clip tag in exon 18. And you can see here that when you compare uh, the, the, the included form with the skip form, you can see here that if you, if you don't have this here, you have much more of this. So you could think here, instead of regulating by selection of, you could probably select equally the included or the skip uh, isophones, but you degrade the, 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 the form that includes exon 18 by the microprocessor. So there could be another way, I think it's exciting, of regulating alternative splicing by the microprocessor at the level of mRNA stability of a particular isophone. Okay, so then we found a lot of snow RNAs. We don't understand very much the biology. What is the need to degrade uh, uh, snow RNAs? But we did find several of them, and we have good experiments to show that what the microprocessor actually is doing is not regular. So most snow RNAs in mammalian cells are encoded in introns. So what we could find is that the, the microprocessor is not regulating the, the, the precursor snow RNA, but it's further processing the mature snow RNAs. And this is done here elegantly by Sarah. We primates are distinguished, the, uh, so we take, for example, the U16 SNO RNA, and we again compare uh, uh, the, the wild type cells with the uh, mouse knockout cells for this year 8. And you can see here that the pre, when we use primers, for example, here and here, that, that amplify the, the pre, there is no change, but there is a change when, we, when you amplify the mature SNO RNA. So this tells you that what the microprocessor is doing is digesting the mature SNO RNAs once it is formed. And then this is an interesting observation. So then Sarah did in vitro processing of this by, by uh, uh, IP in, for instance, transfected T7 DCR8 uh, for both SNO RNAs, 16 and 92. And you can see the production of the, of the clip, the product here. But, and this is, uh, but interestingly, this is clipped by the DCR8, but not by Drosha. But Drosha is active because here we know there is cleaving in microRNA. So what this suggests, and we have done many more experiments, is that what this array is doing here is binding to an RNA and digesting it by in combination with a nucleus that is different from Drosha. And we have some hints of what the nucleus could be, and we try to identify that, to, to verify that. So in our uh, idea here, in, in, in this particular case, or different uh, target for the cell, for the DGCR8, for the microprocessor, this could be not an activity of the microprocessor, of the bona fide microprocessor. This is not DGCR8 in combination with Russia, but DGCR8 in combination with something else, and this something else perhaps has a catalytic activity to clip that. So that's exciting, and now what we're doing is trying to confirm that X is indeed a nucleus and try to identify new targets for this, for this pathway. So let me finish with, with the last uh, target I want to discuss is transposable elements. And, and we're going to focus here on this type of, of, of line elements, which are common in humans, and we also in ALU elements. So we find a lot of, uh, so all the, the, there are many, many copies at the DNA level, but these are not highly transcribed. So there are not that many RNAs in somatic cells, or in cells that we do the, these assays. So what is interesting here is basically it's good for the somatic cells to limit the level of, of, of transposition, and this is done in germ lines by the pi RNAs and so forth, and most in somatic cells by, by, by DNA methylation. So we reason whether it would be possible that the microprocessor could be actually binding and digesting this, and that could be another way of, of, of uh, perhaps limiting the rate of transposition of elements that have escaped the control by methylation. So this is a, a, a joint project between the two Saras in my lab, Sara Eras and Sara Masia, both from Spain, which confused the Anglo-Saxons in the, in the unit. So uh, what Sara Eras here was able to show is, again, using as a, a, a tool this DGRA knockout. And here we use primers for different variants of, the, of this. But basically, we can show here, when we look at the uh, levels of RNA of this L1, which encodes two 
open reading frame, which encode most of the proteins required for the retrotransposition event, is that the level of RNAs, L1 and RNA, go up if you don't have this ECR8. And Sarah also was able to show that uh, the levels of protein, when we use uh, here uh, antibodies against ORP1, you can see again the levels of protein go up. So basically this suggests that having the DGCR8, you limit the level of mRNA and you limit the, you limit the level of protein of this particular element. How does this work? Uh, I, I think I, for, I don't have the slide. Well, we, 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 I, don't have, I forgot to include the slide, but we, we were able to show that we can do in vitro processing by DGCR8 of these elements, and in this case, depends also on the Russia. So it's a, this is a typical microprocessor that can bind to, to these elements and we have a lot of clip tags in the 5 prime ETR and can digest these elements and we also have experiments retrotransposition uh, assays in vivo we can see several things. We can see that uh, as I showed in this and the previous slide if you have this year 8 you have lower levels of L1 mRNA. If you have this year 8 you have lower levels of, of protein from, from ORF1 or ORF2, and then we can show that the microprocessor can indeed process in vitro these events, and we have by retrotransposition assays, we can also show that it's possible uh, to limit the retro, actual retrotransposition by the activity of the microprocessor. <coughs> so let me summarize this last part of the talk in which our main hypothesis, or not hypothesis, our sort of fishing expedition, was trying to identify cellular RNA targets for the microprocessor. The, the reasoning being that the GCR8 is the first activity to contact RNA that have a stem loop structure, like microRNAs do. And so, what do we, so we, we use this protocol, we have quite a of expertise in doing the hits clip. So, what are the, the things that we expect to see, we find, but it's basically the, all the microRNAs. And one mRNA, the only mRNA that has been described to be targeted by the microprocessor, was this DCR8 mRNA itself. But then we found a lot of, of uh, mRNAs. We found uh, SNO RNAs, another long, long coding RNAs, and we found retrotransposon. How many of these are artifacts? How many of these are real targets? In the case of mRNA, we have validated the mRNA abundance for many of them, and we also have shown that in certain cases, where the clip tag occurs in an alternative exon, that the activity of the microprocessor can indeed regulate alternative splicing. In the case, and this activity is very much an activity of the microprocessor, depends on digital rate and in the, of the Russia. In the case of L1 retrotransposons, we can show that this can act to, to limit the level of, of L1 mRNA and therefore protein and therefore retrotransposition. And we propose that this could be an additional mechanism to restrict the transposition in somatic cells. And finally, uh, some sort of curiosity, which is we, we found, and we don't know this, whether this is applicable to more RNAs than SNO RNAs. We can find that it's a DCRA mediated cleavage of SNO RNAs that acts independently of the Russia. So this could, why it is working? This is either to regulate the level of mature SNO RNAs or to produce some small RNAs which have an, some unknown function. But the important thing here, mechanistically for us, is that this is a paradigm for an activity that is DCRA dependent but Russia independent. And so let me summarize again. So from this part, we can identify previous targets, mRNAs, alternative splicing, 5 primitives and promoters, no RNAs in a Russia independent manner, long long coding RNAs, and retrotransposers. So I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to acknowledge the people that did the work. So we're based in, in the MRC Human Genetics Unit, which is now part of this new institute called Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine with the CRUK and the, and the University of Edinburgh. So these are the people in my lab, the old postdocs, and all women uh, in the lab. And the work that I, that, I, that I alluded today is basically the microRNA world was started by a very talented postdoc, Sonia Gil, who went back with the, to Barcelona with the Ramonica Hall Fellowship, uh, and with Gracia Mislake, he started his lab in Edinburgh a few months ago. And then uh, the current people, and I also forgot to mention Jeremy Sanford, who did the work on translation of SR proteins. And the people in the lab doing the work now on DGCR8 and microRNAs are Sarah Eras and Sarah Macias. Our collaborators, the bioinformatician, is Colin Sempo. Another bioinformatician in Barcelona, Eduardo Eras, and Michael Sattler. And this is Edinburgh with Soul of Sun someday. Thank you. <laughs>